Turn to Psalm 119, verse 57. We're going to read verses 57 to 64. Psalm 119, verse 57. The scripture says, The Lord is my portion. I have promised to keep your words. I sought your favor with my whole heart, all my heart. Be gracious to me according to your word. I considered my ways and turned my feet to your testimonies. I hastened and did not delay to keep your commandments. The cords of the wicked have encircled me, but I have not forgotten your law. At midnight I shall rise to give thanks to you because of your righteous ordinances. I am a companion of all those who fear you and of those who keep your precepts. The earth is full of your loving kindness, O Lord. Teach me your statutes. The writer of Psalm 119 is a man who's fully committed to the word of God. If you read the psalm, it's pretty obvious that that's the case. And as such, his mindset is one that views the world and everyone and everything in it through the lens of Scripture. That is how all believers should see everything. Their mindset regarding anything that they come across, any philosophy, any idea, any thought, any discussion, any conversation, should be filtered by the Word of God. Their thoughts should be informed by the Bible so that what they think about on any issue is exactly how the Lord wants them to think. We say this all the time. It's hard to get everybody to, for some reason, to adhere to this. And in this section, we have the psalmist's perspective on several areas vital to his life. We have his perspective on his Lord, on his himself, on his trials, on his friendships, and on the earth on which he lives. These thoughts are thoroughly biblical that he says about all these issues and should be the, the, the way every believer thinks and the perspective that we should have of these things is the same perspective that the psalmist had. Let's start with the psalmist's perspective of his Lord. The psalmist's perspective of his Lord, verse 57, says, The Lord is my portion. I have promised to keep your words. I sought your favor with all my heart. Be gracious to me according to your word. So how does the writer of the Psalm 119 view the Lord? He says in verse 57, the Lord is my portion. That idea is seen elsewhere. For example, Psalm 16, verse 5, he says, David says in that place, the Lord is the portion of my inheritance. I like the word portion, but what does it mean? Well, it has to do with the share of an inheritance. Sometimes in a will, a person will bequeath their children maybe some land or a house or something like that. And it legally belongs to their children. They can expect to receive it one day. Uh, it is called in the Bible their portion. It rightfully belongs to them. Now, in the Old Testament, the tribes were, were promised a portion or a share of land as their inheritance in the land of Canaan. I'll read Numbers 33, uh, 50 to 54 for you, or at least paraphrase some of this. But it says in Numbers 53, or rather, Numbers 33, 50, the Lord spoke to Moses. And he said, look, when you guys go into the land of Canaan and you drive out all the inhabitants and you take possession of the land, verse 54, you shall inherit the land by lot according to your families. To the larger you shall give more inheritance. To the smaller you shall give less inheritance. Whatever the lot falls to anyone, that shall be his. You shall inherit according to the tribes of your fathers. And so that applied to all tribes of Israel with the exception of one, the tribe of Levi. Numbers chapter 18, verse 20, the Lord said to Aaron, in other words, he said to the tribe of Levi, you, tribe of Levi, shall have no inheritance in their land, nor, nor own any portion among them. Well, that doesn't seem very fair. Why would, not, why would the Lord exclude the tribe of Levi from an inheritance, a portion of their inheritance? And Today's world, that would not fly. They would be highly upset. People would be highly upset today. But it happened in, this, in the Old Testament. And so let me read this whole verse, Numbers 18, 20. It says, The Lord said to the Aaron, or to the tribe of Levi, You shall have no inheritance in their land, nor any portion among them. We want to concentrate on the word portion. And then he goes on to say this. The Lord says, I am your portion. 
I am your inheritance among the sons of Israel. The Lord is to be the portion of the Levites. So you might think, wow, are the Levites getting ripped off? Because they don't get any land like everybody else. Yes, they are allotted cities scattered through Israel to live in, kind of like a parsonage, but they don't get an inheritance like everybody else. So did they get ripped off, you might think? No, they did not get ripped off. They had something greater than just land. They had the Lord himself. He was their portion. He was their share. He was their inheritance. Now, other Israelites could, of course, know the Lord, but the tribe of Levi had the special privilege of serving him now and then with a reward to come. They had the special privilege of serving him in a special way of approaching near unto him to offer sacrifices. And they had to especially depend upon him. You remember, it was the Levites that were given the tithes to take care of their needs. The Net Bible translation of verse 57 is this. It says, the Lord is my source of security. My source of security. We're talking about the Lord as our portion. And the Net Bible note there says this. The psalmist compares the Lord to land property. He compares the Lord to land property, which was foundational in that society to economic stability in ancient Israel. They depended upon that land. It was crucial for them to have it. In the same manner, the Lord is foundational to the spiritual stability of the people. He is foundational to that. The psalmist certainly saw him in that light. An old commentator, Albert Barnes, says this, God was to him, to the psalmist and to the Levites, what other people seek in wealth and honor and pleasure and fame. To him, God was all and all, and he asked for nothing else. His testimony is that everything he possesses is bound up in his relationship to the Lord. And so the psalmist says, the Lord is my portion. He's my all in all. He's my everything. He's my sufficiency. He is my security. He's all I need. This is a very personal statement of love, of, of appreciation, of comfort, of knowing the Lord. Very personal. You are my portion, O Lord. Can you say that? Those are the words of a satisfied soul. Satisfied in God, he's satisfied with the portion received. And that portion is the Lord himself, even if he gets no land at all. Now, what greater possession can a person have than the Lord himself? A lot of people are fooled by the theology of the prosperity gospel because they're promised wealth, and so they want wealth as their portion. That is what they value the most. And in that theology, apparently the Lord is a, a means to an end. And so they, if they're being honest, they would have to say, my portion is wealth. But the child, for the child of God, the one who... Christ died for, paid a price for, substituted himself in our place for. Our portion is the Lord himself. I love Psalm 16, verse 5 and 6. David said this, The Lord is the portion of my inheritance. Indeed, my heritage is beautiful to me. I'm so thankful, David says, this is so great, so wonderful, so beautiful, that my inheritance is the Lord. Now, like the Levites, David knows that what matters more than anything in life is that he knows the Lord. He has the Lord. Nothing's better. Nothing will satisfy the heart more than, than that. And so to possess God, he knows, to possess God is truly everything, everything to him. Of course, we possess him because he first possessed us. We know that. And so you're not missing out. If you have no possessions in this life except for the Lord only, you're not missing out. If all you have is the Lord as your possession, he's your only portion in life, that's all you have and nothing else, you're not missing out. Because in Christ, what does Colossians 2, 3 say? In Christ are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Colossians 1, 12 says that we should give thanks to the Father who qualified us to share, to have a portion to ha in the inheritance of the saints in light. This is our portion to know the Lord. So out of gratitude for the Lord, for this great heritage in life the psalmist has, Throughout eternity, he says this in verse 57, The Lord is my portion. I have promised to keep your words. Or literally, I have said I would keep your word. Now, it seems to me if the Lord is your, is your portion in life, that you would desire to do his bidding. That you would give careful attention to the words he has spoken as recorded in his written word. This commitment to his word is going to be reflected in your life. People are going to see this. They're going to know that the Lord is your portion. They should see this. To say the words, the Lord is my portion, the Lord is my sufficiency, the Lord is everything to me, and yet 
you don't make the, the, the word of the Lord the rule of your life, that's contradictory. That is a contradiction. Can't be. It goes against all common sense. If the Lord is your portion, then the Lord's word is also your portion. You, don't have to, you can't have one without the other. And so he makes this promise. But not only does he make this promise, he prays for God's intervention in his life. You see, he's heading up to verse 61. Verse 61 will tell us he's facing a real trial in life. And so in verse 58, he prays, I sought your favor with all my heart. Literally, literally that means he sought God's presence or he entreated God's face is what the literal word is. He entreated God's face with all his heart. Now, to say that you entreated God's face, and I know you can't see that in English, that's what it means, is a way to describe a close personal relationship with the Lord. He has this close relationship with God. He wants to seek his face. And so he makes his appeal to God for his grace, for his mercy. He says, be gracious to me. That I, that, that's the idea of showing mercy. He wants God's mercy upon him, and he, and he humbly seeks God's mercy, and he prays according to the word. Now, God has promised mercy all throughout his word for those who sincerely seek him. Again and again, he'll, he'll show mercy, mercy to those who seek him. And the psalmist knows this, and he says, and, and he promises to keep God's word, and he knows that the Lord will show him mercy according to his word. As I said, everything this man does, he filters through the word of God. And so he, his perspective of the Lord is this, the Lord is my portion. He's everything to me. Secondly, the psalmist's perspective of himself, of himself, verse 59 and 60, he says, I considered my ways and turned my feet to your testimonies. I hastened and did not delay to keep your commandments. He says, I considered my ways. What a great line that is. He gave thought to his ways. He contemplated this ways, his ways. And he realized the only way I can walk is in, is in the commandments of God, the path of his testimonies. Now that is an activity we should engage in quite often. Maybe, in fact, every day we should think about that. It's a time for self-examination. To consider your ways. You, to ask yourself the question, where am I headed in life right at this point? Where am I going spiritually? Am I walking in the path of God's commandments am i walking his way that's a time for self-reflection is it toward the lord or am i going in the wrong direction because it's so easy for us to do that what was it that got the prodigal son into trouble he didn't consider his ways he got his inheritance very quickly and luke 15 13 states that he went on a journey he went on his way a journey a journey to where he went to a distant country and there it says he squandered his estate his portion, with loose living. He squandered his share, his portion, his estate, his inheritance. But then it says, fortunately in the text, but when he came to his senses or when he came to himself, then he made the return trip back to the Lord because he finally did something he hadn't done before. He considered his ways. And he thought to himself, what in the world am I doing here anyway in this mess? I need to go back to my father. And he realized what a disastrous direction he had taken and he went back to the Lord because he considered his ways. Now, unlike the prodigal son, the psalmist who wrote this is a very godly man, a man of the word. He's not a man who's living in open sin, but the fact that verse 59 says, look at verse 59 carefully, he turned his feet to the direction of the word of God could possibly suggest he was a bit off course. Now, nobody's perfect. Everybody tried to stay on course of the word of God. Of course, we know the Holy Spirit's helping us. We know God is helping us. We know we have his grace to help us, all these things. We know that. And yet, we, because of our nature, our tendency is to go off course, even if it be just a little bit. And maybe he's been off course. Maybe it could be that because he does love the Lord, he does walk with God, he is a man of the word, that maybe he just wants to maintain his direction in, on that track. Now, if you or I have gone off on a rabbit trail, or worse, Maybe we've struck out on our own trail deliberately and made our own way in life. We had better stop and consider our ways. And the sooner the better. That's why it needs to be a daily pursuit to think about and consider our ways. Where are we headed as far as God is concerned, as far as his word is concerned? And some have failed to do that, and as a result, they've drifted. They drift. That's what, that's what happens. You drift a little bit at a time until you're far away. After a while, you're far away from the dock, like a boat would be. And the way back to God and his word starts with 
a consideration of your ways, and then a turning of your feet back to the Word of God. And that's where many believers go wrong. They don't give time to consider their ways. They don't give time to think about their ways, to ponder the course of their lives, and they begin to drift. And that drift first becomes noticeable. Have you noticed this in churches? First becomes noticeable because the person stops showing up to the worship services. Maybe he misses a Sunday morning. Now, we're in a time period where not many people are at the worship services, but you know what I mean. We're back to normal times. person misses a Sunday here. He misses a Wednesday night there. And then their absenteeism grows stronger and stronger. And after a while, we say, hey, what happened to so-and-so? Where did he go? Where is he at? In the meantime, those persons, people stop hearing the word. In the meantime, their lives are in total shambles. And nobody even knows what's going on with them. All because they, not, they don't consider their ways. Turn your feet. If you're in this condition tonight, turn your feet back to the word of God and get back on the path of righteousness. Verse 59 calls his word your testimonies. That's the synonym for the word of God. The word is a testimony to God's character, to his nature, to his will, and it holds us accountable. It's a witness that holds our thoughts accountable, that our actions accountable. If we're walking contrary to God's will, God's character, the testimonies of God's word hold us accountable to that. So we do as the psalmist did. We take action and we turn our feet toward the direction of the word of God. Now, elsewhere in the Bible, that's called repentance. Repentance is changing, change of direction. Basically, in your life, you were walking toward worldliness. Now you're walking toward godliness, and God works in your heart to bring you to that place. This decision the psalmist made here in verse, 50, verse 58, 9, I consider my ways. This decision to turn his feet back to the Lord's word was not long in coming after he considered his ways. Look at verse, verse 60. After he considers his ways, he says, I hasten, and I did not delay to keep your commandments. Now, he could have, said, he could have just said, I hasten to keep your commandments. We would have understood. But he doubles up on this idea, and he says, and he adds another phrase, I, not only hasten, I, didn't, I did not delay. He wants us to know, he wants the Lord to know, I mean business. I mean business. And he says, basically, I'm going to get after it, and I'm not going to procrastinate. And that's what he does. Now, many times we're quick to sin, but slow to repentance. That's often the case, and it should be the other way around. We should, we're eager to desire to do the things that we want to do, not so eager to do what God wants us to do. And so we need to think in terms of quickening our pace to come back to the Word of God and get back in track, back in the direction that we should go. And so the psalmist gives us his perspective of his Lord and of himself. And thirdly, notice the psalmist's perspective of his trials, his trials in verses 61 and 62. He says, the cords of the wicked have encircled me, but I have not forgotten your law. At midnight I shall rise to give thanks to you because of your righteous ordinances. Now, if you read all the way through Psalm 119, and that is a worthy project. In fact, uh, somebody said that if you read through, it's 176 verses. If you, read, if you meditate on one verse a day, <clears throat> you can do that twice a year. If you read through it, you're going to find a repeated theme, and that is this. The psalmist has enemies. And they are after him. They're coming after him. They want to get him. He's constantly bringing up the subject to the Lord and in his prayer. And that's what we should do. We should bring up things like this to the Lord constantly. Look at verse 22. He says, take away reproach and contempt for me. For I observe your testimonies. Even though princes, now these, people, these are people in high places. Even though princes sit and talk against me. They're talking against me. Your servant meditates on your statutes. Look at verse 39. Turn away my reproach, which I dread. Talking about the reproach again. Verse 41. May your loving kindness also come to me, O Lord, your salvation according to your word. So I will have an answer for him who reproaches me. People are reproaching me. Verse 51. The arrogant utterly deride me. And you can trace that throughout the rest of the psalm. He keeps talking about this, how he's, he, these people are coming after him. They're his enemies. They hate him. They deride him. They talk against him. And here in verse 61, he says, The cords of the wicked have encircled me. The cords are snares. They're traps set by ungodly men. They're trying to trap him uh, as if they're portrayed as hunter, hunters who are going after a bird of prey. And so they set a trap, as hunters would for a bird of prey, and they want to trap him. And so really, in, in reality, the psalmist is the victim. They're trying to get him. 
They want to dispose of him. Why? He's standing in their way. He's the man of God. He's the man of the word. He's the godly man. They don't like that. They're wicked men. They want to get rid of him. In verse 110, he says, The wicked have laid a snare for me. Again, he says that. Verse 85, The arrogant have dug pits for me, men who are not in accord with your law. So the people who are not in accord with God's word, who hate the word of God, who want nothing to do with it, they're the ones after him. This is the trial he faces. And it's all too real, and it brings him pain. When he thinks about it, you can feel his pain as you read through this psalm. Now, David, who may have been the author of this psalm, may not have been, doesn't say who was the author, was often surrounded by enemies, snares of the wicked. And if you recall the, in, this, in 1 Samuel, the prior to his kingship, 2 Samuel, King Saul is chasing him all over the countryside, trying to kill him, trying to get rid of him. And then at one point in his kingship, Absalom actually steals his son Absalom, steals the kingdom from him. And so David is often speaking of the trials that he had, that if the writer is someone else other than David, he too is hounded by enemies, whoever it is. Now your trials may not be as severe as the psalmist. You may not be, have people trying to kill you. People in high places may not be mocking you. They might not even know who you are. But the trials you face for you are nevertheless difficult. You, you feel the difficulty in them, even if nobody else does, and you may even sense a great deal of inward pain. So, first of all, rec- let's recognize the reality of the, of the situation, the problem, the trial. So what do you do? Well, for one thing, you pray, as the psalmist did, and, seek, and bring this to God, like James 1.5, seek wisdom from God in your trials. You can do that. You should do that. That goes without saying. But there is another element, and the middle of trials that brings us comfort, that, that strengthens us, that encourages us, and that is the word of God. You would not want to forsake that in that time. He says in verse 61, The cords of the wicked have encircled me, but I have not forgotten your law. Now he feels hemmed in. He feels pressured. He feels surrounded by his foes. He, but he doesn't allow the external pressure to keep him from his greatest source of comfort, the word of God. A lot of people would do that. The greatest source of comfort you have is the word of God. Don't put it aside. Unlike the man in James 1, he does not intend on forgetting the word of God. He says, I'm not going to forget it. Now, you know, it may be easy in a trial to neglect the word of God because you can become so consumed with the trial, so consumed with the difficulty, that you might lay aside the word of God. You might even think, well, this isn't doing me a whole lot of good. That would be a huge mistake. And, and there are believers also who, have spend, who spend such little time in the Word that when a trial does come, they are ill-prepared to deal with it. They just are not ready. They have not fortified themselves with the truth. But I will tell you this, ready or not, understand your greatest resource in trial, in a trial, is the comforting, encouraging hope to be found in the Scriptures. Verse 92 of the same psalm, he says this, David says, or the, the writer, whoever it is, says, If your law had not been my delight, then I would have perished in my affliction. If I had not got a hold of your word in my trials, I I don't know where I'd be today, he says. Back in 1846 to 1856, somewhere around there, there was a, what was called the Highland Potato Famine. Now, that's not the Irish Potato Famine. This is Highland in in the Scottish Highlands, the Western Scottish Highlands. And there was a, the, the people there were suffering from lack of food in that time period. And it was said there was never a more severe time of distress for that area than that time. Now, there was some kind of public charity available at that time for the, the very poor people. But they were giving, given some money every day, barely enough to live on, just to help the poor out. And uh, there's a report given of a poor, old, frail woman who was in a grocery store one day, the grocery store of that day. And she only had a few coins, not much, she couldn't buy much of anything. And so she took the coins and first of all bought the necessities, the things she absolutely had to have, which were very little. And I want to read the rest, a couple of lines here about what happened. Somebody witnesses the vet in this store. And this guy says, this woman, this widow woman, this poor frail widow woman, she came to the last penny she had after buying just a handful of necessities, <coughs> She came to her last penny, and, she, and with a cheerful resignation on her wrinkled face, she said, 
Now I must buy oil with this. I must buy oil for my lamp to see at night. I must buy oil with this, last penny. <clears throat> Why? That I may see to read my Bible during these long dark, night, dark nights, for it is my only comfort now, when every other comfort has gone away. No husband, no money. And she said, the only comfort I have left is the word of God. I want to read it. And feast or famine, we must not forget the word of God. She didn't want to forget it. The psalmist didn't want to forget it. The wicked here could not hinder, they could not destroy the psalmist's determination to keep the word of God. He's going to remain faithful no matter what, no matter what the trial. He's going to be committed, and he is committed. And so he says, I have not forgotten your law. Even in the midst of this difficulty, this trial, I have not forgotten your law. That would be the worst thing you could do, was to forget the word of God in a trial. Not only did he not forget the, the word, he thinks about it day and night. Look at verse 62. At midnight, he says, in fact, at midnight I shall rise and give thanks to you because of your righteous ordinances. Not only did he not forget it, he thinks about it. He says, I'm going to rise at midnight. Midnight? I can tell you I'm asleep at midnight. Now, some people in this church are not asleep at midnight. They stay up till 1 or 2 in the morning. I am not one of those people. I go to bed before that. And back then, I imagine people went to bed early. It's a farming community, and people didn't go to bed late. They didn't have entertainment all night. They didn't have electricity. They had to go to bed. They had to get up early. But still, to get up at 12 a.m. is not a full night's sleep. So why did he want to get up at 12 a.m.? I can't even imagine that. <laughs> he wanted to get up to give thanks for God's word. That's why. That's why, one reason, to give thanks for God's word. That's a purposeful activity. He plans on doing it. Notice the intentional phrase here, I shall rise. I shall rise. That's not because he couldn't sleep. It's not because he's tossing and turning. This is a deliberate decision to get up for one purpose, to thank God for his word. Now, I don't know why he decided to do this at midnight, but he didn't consider it too sacrificial to thank the Lord. It was a purposeful activity. Maybe he wants to show his gratitude around the clock for God and for his word. Some of us have a hard time being grateful when we get a good night's sleep. But this man, willing to rise at midnight to express a heart of gratitude for the word of God. The Puritan Thomas Manton said, no hour is unreasonable for, to a gracious heart. No hour of the day or night, doesn't matter what it is, is unreasonable to the heart that is gracious, he says. And so, even Jesus prayed all night at times. David said I, he prays God seven times a day. Spurgeon said, every hour is canonical to a saint. Canonical meaning, he's talking about the canon of scripture. It's every hour of the day or night is good for the word of God. Good to read it, good to study it, good to give thanks for it, whatever it is. Every hour is canonical to the saint. Now, the wicked people in verse 61 want nothing to do with the righteous ordinances in verse 62. It's those righteous ordinances, those righteous judgments that are going to judge them on the last day. They don't want anything to do with it, but the righteous are thankful, should be thankful for the written word God has given us. And so we have the psalmist's perspective of his Lord, of himself, of his trials, and fourthly, of his friends. His perspective of his friends, verse 63, he says, I am a companion of all those who fear you and of those who keep your precepts. Who is the, the psalmist chosen to be his friends? Anybody that fears God. Anybody that fears God is his friends. The word companion refers to a very close bond that can exist between persons. These are spiritual friendships based on our relationship with the Lord. You can see how close these bonds become to us. Often in the church, they become this way, should become this way. And with these people, we can have fellowship. Because they have fellowship with the Lord. And with the Son, Jesus Christ, we can have fellowship with them. That's how it should be. The people we keep company with influence us far greater than we'll ever know. A huge influence on, on us. And so we should choose our friends wisely. Psalm 13, I'm sorry, Proverbs 13.20 says, a verse I've always liked, Proverbs 13.20, He who walks with wise men shall be wise, but a companion of fools will suffer harm. We've got to be careful. This doesn't mean we don't deal with the people of the world. We do deal with them in business and other ways. But make sure your close friends are people who fear God. That's your close, should be your closest friends. Godly friends are such a tremendous blessing. 
They help us bear up under the, trial, under the trials of life. This guy's going through trials. He needs friends that will help him. We need friends that will help us in such times. And the psalmist is surrounded by the snares of the wicked. He could sure use some godly friends to help him out in this time. You know, it's a sad thing when you can't count on your friends. Job had friends, but he couldn't count on them, he learned, even though they were called his friends. But true friends will help people even in their darkest hour. Godly friends encourage us to grow spiritually. They give us good advice. They give us godly advice. They point us to the Lord. This is nothing but good coming out of this. 2 Timothy 2.22 says, Pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace with those. You pursue these things with those who call on the Lord from a pure heart. So when we associate with God's people, they, that helps to propel us towards godliness and keep us from ungodliness. And a young man, a woman uh, of the word, a young person of the word, a man of the word will choose friends who fear the Lord. That is his perspective. And finally, in verse 64, the psalmist's perspective of the earth, of the earth, it says, the earth is full of your loving kindness, O Lord. Teach me your statutes. Everywhere the psalmist looks, he sees the handiwork of God in nature. He sees the provision of God in nature. And he concludes this, God is good. God is full of, the earth is full of his loving kindness. I see it everywhere. We might call that common grace. His sun shines on the just and the unjust. He gives rain from heaven. He gives life and breath to all. The world is full of his loving kindness. You know, the theologians uh, years ago used to speak of two books, and that was the book of nature and the book of scripture. The first part of verse 64 is speaking of the book of nature or what we call general revelation. It's how God has revealed himself in nature. <clears throat> Psalms 24.1 says the earth is the Lord's and all it contains. The world's under his loving care. That's why the psalmist says the earth is full of your loving kindness, O Lord. Unfortunately, we have spurned his goodness and we sinned and, and so the world's under a curse. And so we have things like the coronavirus and we have things like cancer and we have things like flu and many other things. And yet God still extends his loving kindness, in spite of all that, throughout the earth. But that's our fault for sinning and getting us into this mess and this curse. So we praise the Lord for the book of nature he has made, but we are talking about a two-volume work and it's not complete unless we have the second volume that is the book, of, the book of Scripture, or what we call special revelation. And so in the last line, the psalmist says, Teach me your statutes. <clears throat> After viewing the hand and work of God and seeing his loving kindness in the earth, he says, I want to know more about this God I serve. I want to know him in his word, because what he sees in nature will be explained in Scripture. And, he says, and so he says, Teach me your statutes. He must learn the word of God. Can I suggest a good prayer for all of us to pray? That is, teach me your statutes. Teach me your decrees. Teach me what you have prescribed in your word. I want to know what it says. I want to know what it means. I want to know what, how to live it. And so his, pra his praise, the psalmist's praise for God's world, is, leads to his, his desire to learn God's word. Now, unfortunately, a person can observe the beauty of God in nature. He can see all this and yet never come to salvation in Christ. And, and that's why we need the book of Scripture. He must hear of the gospel of salvation, 1 Corinthians 15, 3. Christ died for our sins according to scripture. He was buried, he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. Why did he die? To save us from sin. To deliver us. Only he could do that. Only he could save from sin and the wrath of God. Only him, <clears throat> I have nobody here that's listening to me tonight, remains in their sinful condition, spiritually dead condition. If they don't know the Lord, <clears throat> turn from your sin tonight, turn to Christ. Where do we learn about this gospel of Christ? In the book of Scripture. In the book of Scripture. We should pray that the Lord will teach us to know his word. To know all that we have in Christ. Mike talked about all that we have in Christ in Ephesians 3 this morning. We should pray that we should know that God would teach us to know all that we have in him. The hope that we have in Christ. So Psalm 119 reveals to us again and again <coughs> that its writer was a man of the word, obviously. As a result, his perspective on everything in life, as our perspective should be, is drawn from the word. His perspective of his Lord, of himself, of his trials, of his friends, and of the very planet he lives on comes from the, the scriptures. Well, that's the psalmist. So what about you? What is your perspective on life? How do you determine your perspective on a given matter? People 
Christians come to us all the time. What do, I, what do, what do we do about this situation? What do we do about that situation? <clears throat> and the, the bottom line is this. What does the word of God say to do about these things? What does the wisdom of God say to do about these things? And for the believer, the answer is clear, crystal clear. We gain our perspective on everything from God's own word. And in doing so, we have God's perspective himself, his, his own perspective. That is the only perspective we need. And that's what we need tonight to be people of the word, people that love the word, people that are into the word, like this psalmist, and people who pray, teach me your statutes. Let's close in prayer. Father in heaven, we pray that you'll help us to be people of the word uh, every day. Help us to consider our ways, lest we turn from your word, lest we go on a trail that would lead us astray from your word. People that are away tonight, Lord, that have been away for a long time, we pray you'll call them back to yourself. We pray that you will bring them back to yourself, back to your truth, back to your word, back from their sin, and back to you, Lord. We pray that we'll look for these people and that we will graciously intervene in their life as well. Give us the grace to do that. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen.